In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for this time together in your word. This time is community, and though it may be online, Lord, we thank you for all of the ways that you call us to yourself, all of the ways in which you speak to us, and that your Holy Spirit guides us. And so we pray, Lord, that our hearts, our minds, and our ears would be open to listen, receive, and be challenged by your word. We pray, God, that you would send us comfort, answers. You would convict us in the ways that we need to grow, ways we need to be challenged. And that we would know when we read these words that we encounter you. You are the word made flesh. And so we ask, Lord, as we dive into scripture, the words of the Bible, that we encounter you face to face in our own lives, speaking to us as we are right now. We know that you knew we would be watching this, we would be receiving this word, that we would be in this community, and we just ask, Lord, that you help us to be ready and willing to accept whatever you have in store. And so set aside any distractions that we may have, Lord, we lay them at your feet, any worries, doubts, fears, uh, lists of things to do later or tomorrow, whatever it may be, Lord, we just ask that you help us to enter into this time, this moment, as we read sacred scripture together. We pray all of these things in your most precious name, Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome. <clears throat> this evening we are in Luke chapter 6, reading verses 39 to 45. This is the gospel for this upcoming Sunday, the eighth Sunday in Ordinary Time. It is our last Sunday in Ordinary Time before the season of Lent begins. And so we are continuing on with the Sermon on the Plain in the Gospel of Luke that we've been in in the past few weeks. And this is a continuation, direct continuation of last week's gospel. And so as always, we're going to read through this twice. I invite you to place yourself back in the uh, story. Remember, we are in a plain near um, the Sea of Galilee in the region of Galilee an equal uh, playing field for everyone. Jesus speaking to a large crowd of Jews and Gentiles from Tyre and Sidon, very wealthy, probably noble people, but also people from Jerusalem and people from Judea. Uh, and so there could be Pharisees and scribes, his disciples, his 12 apostles are there, all in this area here receiving this teaching of compassion, uh, of what it is like to minister or be a part of this upside down kingdom of Jesus. And so this lesson continues in Luke 6, beginning in verse 39. First time through, place yourself in this scene and get a sense for what is being said. <clears throat> Jesus told them a parable. Can a blind person guide a blind person? Will not both fall into a pit? No disciple is superior to the teacher. But when fully trained, every disciple will be like his teacher. Why do you notice the splinter in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the wooden beam in your own? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me remove that splinter in your eye, when you do not even notice the wooden beam in your own eye? You hypocrite! Remove the wooden beam from your eye first, then you will see clearly to remove the splinter in your brother's eye. A good tree does not bear rotten fruit, nor does a rotten tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For people do not pick figs from thorn bushes, nor do they gather grapes from brambles. A good person, out of the store of goodness in his heart, produces good. But an evil person, out of a store of evil, produces evil. For from the fullness of the heart, the mouth speaks. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. We're now going to read this a second time, as always. And on the second time, if you're just joining us for the first time, what we do is we listen very attentively to each word as it is read. Now, you can do this with your eyes closed. You can follow along in the text. But try and remove from your mind anything else other than following along with these words and keeping in mind the scene and the story, of course, but fo focusing particular attention on the words and seeing if there's a particular word or phrase that resonates with you or strikes you for any particular reason, okay? 
could have nothing to do with this passage. It could just remind you of something that's been going on in your life, a memory, an event from earlier today, something coming up, uh, a person in your life, whatever it may remind you of. Take that and receive that as a way in which the Lord is trying to speak to you and begin to reflect on that. Why did this stand out? What is God trying to say to me? What might he be compelling me to do? And as we read through this the second time through, I invite you to take note of those things, uh, mention what they are in the live chat or in the comments, as well as any questions that you have about this reading as we continue together. Luke 6, verse 39. And Jesus told them a parable. Can a blind person guide a blind person? Will not both fall into a pit? No disciple is superior to the teacher, but when fully trained, every disciple will be like his teacher. Why do you notice the splinter in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the wooden beam in your own? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me remove that splinter in your eye, when you do not even notice the wooden beam in your own eye. You hypocrite, remove the wooden beam from your eye first, then you will see clearly to remove the splinter in your brother's eye. A good tree does not bear rotten fruit, nor does a rotten tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For people do not pick figs from thorn bushes, nor do they gather grapes from brambles. A good person out of the store of goodness in his heart produces good. But an evil person, out of a store of evil, produces evil. For from the fullness of the heart, the mouth speaks. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So I invite you to take a few moments to share with those who you are watching with, if you're watching this alone, to also share in the comments and in the live chat. Even if you're watching with others, please feel free to do that so we can see how you are uh, interacting, what, what is resonating with you, what speaks to you in this text, uh, so that you can interact with one another. And if you have any questions in particular, make sure you leave those in the comments so we can answer them later if we do not get to them in this video. But I invite you to just take a few moments to reflect on those things, share them uh, in whichever way you would like and uh, continue to reflect on what stood out to you. So I invite you to continue to share those reflections and questions in the live chat and in the comments. But we will uh, go through this in our study line by line. And so as I said, this is a part of the Sermon on the Plain in Luke, and it is compared to the Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of Matthew. Now in the Gospel of Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount encompasses chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew. It is a huge sermon, I think 107-something verses. And so <clears throat> it is very substantial. And it happens up on a mount because it's in accordance with the Jewish tradition of the law being received from Moses on Mount Sinai. And so Jesus is delivering a new law, or not necessarily a new law, but a new interpretation of the old law to get to the heart of it, to get from a place where it's not just about legalism, but it's about compassion. That is something all the prophets sought to do. Jesus is trying to take it even a step further to show how that will eventually lead to salvation and creating this church-like body of Christ community for one another to lead each other uh, to the kingdom of God. Uh, And so in Luke, 
Luke is less concerned with that comparison between the old Jewish covenant and the new law, uh, the kingdom that Jesus is trying to establish, and the way that legalism has taken over all of that, because Luke is speaking to the Gentiles. He's speaking to people who may have no concept of Jewish law and may come from very different experiences. And so, the sermon on the on the plane in Luke is much shorter. It's like 36, 37 verses, um, like almost a third of the size. But it focuses very much on um, kind of everyday wisdom and trying to appeal to logic, trying to appeal to everyday analogies uh, for people to really relate to what the Lord is trying to offer them, what Jesus is trying to offer them. This new kingdom being one that is upside down, that glorifies uh, the poor, the oppressed, or it seeks to comfort those who are poor, oppressed, marginalized, uh, foreign, who are not provided for, who are cast aside, or who don't, don't have high status. And for those who do have high status, it's a reminder to recognize, like, that's not always going to be the case. So Pharisees or scribes who might be there are recognizing, like, it's not just about legalism and the things that you do. It's about what's in your heart. For those from Tyre and Sidon who are there living these lives of luxury, because those are very wealthy uh, trade cities, uh, to recognize, like, all of that will one day go away. Like, what matters is the type of person that you are. And so Jesus continues that message here using everyday wisdom, everyday analogies, which are called in the gospel parables. I believe the word parable or parab uh, paraboline, I think in Greek, means to, to align in such a way or to line up, kind of like parallel, um, where it's, it's basically like an analogy or a metaphor. Something represents something else, but in a very simplistic way for everyone to relate to. And this kind of shows you about the ministry of Jesus when you look at his parables. He uses very everyday common analogies. You know, he doesn't use things that are overly complex. He appeals to farming, uh, vineyards, scattering seed, fishing, you know, these different types of analogies that tradespeople, uh, common people, people who are in the lower echelons of society and did day labor uh, as part of their job or their entirety of their job, these are things they would have related to. And so, in verse 39, it says, And Jesus told them a parable. Now, this is more like a series of parables and small analogies, um, but he makes several of them here. Uh, and first he says, um, Can a blind, blind person guide a blind person? Can a blind person guide a blind person? Now, in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, in Matthew 15, I don't know if I have it marked here, uh, but... He, Jesus calls the Pharisees blind guides, he says, woe to you blind guides. He calls them that many times uh, and calls out the fact that they are living a life of hypocrisy, that they basically have turned to the law as the source for their own fulfillment, um, for their own legalism. And they're using that as an explanation as for why they are adhering to the covenant, why they are so holy. And yet it's not penetrating their hearts. So, for instance, um, you know, kind of in the line of the Sermon on the Mount, a Pharisee might say, oh, well, I'm doing good because I'm not lifting a finger on the Sabbath, and I'm not taking, uh, you know, more than this number of steps, and I'm not making anything. But the question is never asked, like, is the Sabbath and that rest devoting my heart to the Lord on that day really happening? It's more about what I'm expected to do to save face or to appear holy to other people. And so he calls them blind guides, meaning they cannot see the real reason. They cannot see the real purpose of the law. And so this may very well be an accusation of them because we know from previously in the sermon that those who are there gathered are people from Judea and from Jerusalem. Even though Jerusalem is in Judea, they, they, Luke specifically mentions Jerusalem as this epicenter of the temple, of the Jewish legal system and hierarchy, all of that. Uh, so very well could have people there who um, he will later call in the other Gospels blind guides. And so can a blind person guide a blind, guide a blind, blind person? Obviously not. Exactly what's going to happen. Will not both fall into a pit. And so this is what Jesus is accusing them of. He's, he's basically saying, like, look, if, if you're going to turn to these leaders who don't even understand the law themselves, you yourself will end up blind. And where are you going to get? You're going to fall into the pit. And the pit is a phrase that is commonly used as an analogy for hell a place of destruction, uh, the pit being like the, the place where, um, geographically speaking, in the valley of Ben-Himon, which is a nickname for, or where we get the nickname for hell, Gehenna, uh, the pit in which all of these sacrificial embers and ashes were poured from the temple it was also a ancient location of child sacrifice and pagan rituals. It was a very um, 
kind of forsaken place. And because of all of this refuse from the city of Jerusalem being there, it constantly smoldered because of the embers of sacrifices. And so it looked like this kind of um, ruined, destroyed, constantly smoking and fiery hellscape. And that it was in this valley, this large pit. Um, and so this analogy and a lot of analogies of hell are characterized that way down in the pit. So if we are blind, if we don't see the purpose, if we don't have really the love in our heart, if we don't have a relationship with God, if we don't understand the purpose behind our faith and we're just going through the motions, then it's just empty gestures. Same thing would be true in a marriage, okay? If I'm just, if I, you know, provide for my family, you know, I deposit my work check in my bank account, I pay our bills, and, you know, I say I love you to my wife every day. Um, but if that relationship isn't in my heart, if I don't truly love her and if I'm not truly seeking her good, if I'm just kind of putting up with her because this is my life, that is not a healthy relationship. And eventually that will be exposed in some way or the effects of that will be felt and will have consequences. The same thing is true in our relationship with God. So we have to really consciously keep in mind, are the things that I do in relationship to my faith, do they relate to who I am? And do they penetrate below the surface into my heart, into my actual relationship with God and how I see him and how I devote my life to him? Or are these things I've inherited? Or are these things I don't even understand? Or are these things I do just to appear holy uh, because the rest of the week I'm too busy? Or whatever it may be. So it's a challenge to us. And then Jesus continues, no disciple is superior to the teacher. So this is kind of in reference to the thing before this. Like if, if you're being led by someone blind, you're never going to surpass that level. So this is good in terms of the people we surround ourselves with. Um, you know, do you have someone who you look up to who's a mentor, someone who can challenge you and call you to something greater? Uh, if you are young and looking to... Um, apprentice in a certain trade, or if you're looking to change jobs at any point in life, are you willing to go out and learn to seek the person who is the master and learn well from them? Or are you just trying to do it all on your own? Um, we can only go so far by ourselves. And if we're only surrounded by people who are not challenging us spiritually or who are lower in terms of their spiritual engagement than we are, or immoral, less moral than we are, then we're never going to keep pushing that standard, especially on days where we're tired or where we don't feel like it. We need people in our life to challenge us. There's this uh, great thing in tech companies and certain tech startups, it's called a red team. And a red team is a team of people that are elected in the, um, in the company. Basically, when any new idea or project is brought to the table, their job is to criticize it, tear it apart, ask a lot of questions about it, try and like, act as though it's not going to work or point out all of the problems or potential bugs in this project or this idea. And the reason for that is not to discredit every idea, but to really challenge it and make sure, are we serious about what we want to do? Can we bring all of this perspective to the table and recognize it's not going to be perfect? And then once all that discussion is had, can we all together collectively, whether we agree or disagree with this, commit to trying to bring it forward if it's the thing that the company decides to do? And so I read that and I thought that was really smart. And I wondered, do I have a red team for my own life? You know, do I have people in my life who I've given permission to hold me accountable? That when I seek to make a certain decision, when I seek to make a life change, or when I'm, you know, considering something, do I bring it to them? And are they willing to scrutinize and challenge me in alignment with the gospel and make sure that I am continually, continually seeking to do what God is calling me to do? and not just things that are possible or opportunities that I might just be pursuing for status, popularity, money, whatever it might be. And so do you have a red team for your life? Do you have people who teach you, who mentor you? And if not, who are some of those people that you could invite to do that for you, to hold you accountable, uh, to surround yourself with, to challenge you to be better? Because no disciple is superior to the teacher. But when fully trained, every disciple will be like his teacher. The word disciple, the, one of the best translations for it, uh, it's often translated as student, but the, one of the best ones is apprentice. So someone who apprentices under the master. And the goal of an apprentice is basically threefold. It's to be with the master, to become like the master, and then eventually to do what the master does. 
Okay, so be with the master, become like the master, and do what the master does. This was true of disciples in Jesus' time. It's true of apprentices in any trade. Eventually, uh, you get to a place where you can do what they did. And it's a staged process, right? When you're first an apprentice, um, the uh, the master basically says, uh, I will do this and you watch. I will do this and you watch. And then eventually you can get to a point where the master says, all right, I will do this, now you help. I'm doing this still, but you help. And then, at the next stage, that will reverse, and the master will say, okay, now you do this, but I will help. I'll be here just to make sure you've got it, but you're the one doing this, and I'll be here to help. And then it eventually totally reverses to where the master says, now you do this, and I will watch. You do this, and I will watch. Our journey in our discipleship, our relationship with Jesus Christ, is the same. There may be people in our life when we're first learning about the faith, when we're first really taking this seriously, who we just have to be around and watch because we don't really know how to do this yet. But eventually we can start to mimic them, to participate in the same ways that they do, to start getting more engaged. And eventually we get to their level to where maybe we don't need as much guidance. And we always need guidance. Remember, there's not, you do, I leave. You know, there's no state like that. The master's always there watching, helping to correct, helping to guide. But the way in which our lives are being formed or reshaped and transformed to follow him more accurately, to be good apprentices, is becoming more and more honed as we go. So what does that look like in your own life? Because this is something we are all called to do. In fact, one I say this all the time, but one of the most terrifying verses in Scripture, I believe, is John chapter 14, verse 12, where Jesus tells his apostles, He says, Amen, amen, I say to you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do and will do greater ones than these because I am going to the Father. And that we can ask for anything from the Father in the name of Jesus. That in the name of Jesus, through us, we can do the same great works that Jesus did. But that will only come from that path of discipleship. It begins with being with Jesus. So how are you spending time with Jesus? Are you praying? Are you going to Mass consistently? Are you partaking in the sacraments? Are you spending quality time with Jesus every single day? Oh, Matt, I can't do that. I just don't have time. You have time to eat. You have time to work. Okay, you make time for the things you need to do. We have time to sleep. Our bodies need it. Well, our soul has that same kind of need. That if we don't sleep for long enough, our body will start to break down and hallucinate. If we don't pray for long long enough, our soul will start to disengage and will stop compelling us to do good and will be more prone to do evil, do things that are not good for us or that are immoral or against what Jesus calls us to. So we need to make the time. Okay, you'll never have time for everything. There's never going to be a point in your life where, where you retire or you change jobs or whatever, when your kids grow up or when you have, your grandkids are no longer needing care for, whatever it is, where you can say, finally, I have all this time to just do nothing. No, we, we will always have things that we can say yes to and things that we say no to and an amount of time that we can fill or that we can leave open. It's true for us at any point in our lives. That's why they say, how do you spell love? T-I-M-E. You choose to invest your time in the things that you love. Or another way of putting it is, if you want to tell me what you love, if I want to know what you love, show me your calendar and show me your credit card statement. Because where we spend most of our time and most of our money, that indicates what we love, what we worship, what we value. And so that, if that needs to adjust in your life or in mine, to be more conformed with the gospel, more conformed with following Jesus, then we need to make those choices because it's not just going to happen. Time is not just going to fall in our lap. But if we do make those choices, we will find ourselves on that journey of apprenticeship. And all of a sudden, we're, we're with Jesus. Now we're becoming like him. Our lives start to change. We start to make better decisions. We start to be more joyful. When bad things happen, we don't let them get us down. We don't catastrophize or become pessimistic or negative. We recognize, okay, God is with me in this. He's going to bring some good out of this. His will is constantly at work, and I need to trust in Him. And then eventually, through that radical trust and obedience, journeying with Jesus every day, we can do the types of things that he did. We can radically change lives by sharing the gospel, sharing our testimony, praying over people, praying for healing, and those things will happen. There's no silver bullet. It's just spending time with the Lord, following him as his disciple, and progressing through those levels of apprenticeship with him. So that is what Jesus is challenging his followers to do. 
It's not about the money that you have. It's not about the laws that you follow. It's about what is in your heart, what you're devoted to, where you spend your time, who you follow. And it's not so that you will surpass the teacher. It's not some kind of pride or something for show. But you will be able to do what the teacher did, but only in the name of the teacher, in the name of Jesus. So we continue. Verse 41. Why do you notice the splinter in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the wooden beam in your own? My goodness, is there a verse that is not more appropriate to today's political and ideological world's uh, landscape than this verse? I mean, if everyone kept this in mind when they went on Twitter, when they started gaslighting or canceling things, recognizing like, you know, I mean, there are certain things or people that probably need to have a stern talking to or we need to pay less attention to, absolutely. Or they need to be held accountable for the things that they've done. But it doesn't discredit all of the good. It doesn't mean that we can just cancel everything. We have to recognize like everyone makes mistakes. Everyone has a splinter or wooden beam in their eye. But the first thing we need to worry about before we start looking outward is ask the question, am I right with the Lord? Am I right with the Lord? Do I have clean hands before I start commenting on how dirty everyone else's are? And if my hands are clean, I will be more easily able to clearly see where compassion is needed, where challenging is needed, where others need prayer, where I can you know, step out and say, hey, I, I don't know if that's something that you should be doing. That doesn't seem good for you. That doesn't seem right. Uh, only then do we have the ability to see clearly enough to challenge with love. But oftentimes, we tend to get in insecure, right? We tend to get insecure because we know, okay, I'm not perfect, and there's something about that person that's making me reminded of that. So instead of dealing with the things that I need to deal with, we insecurely jab at them. We get angry, we point out the things that are easy to criticize or that we disagree with, just so then we can throw away that person or that argument or that idea and not really let it challenge us or convict us. And the same thing is true with sin. We all sin. It says that in Romans, all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. So we are all on a train with a one-way ticket to hell. The only reason we get off that train is because Jesus created a stop when he was crucified on the cross for our sins. And that stop is offered to us at any point in our life, but eventually we have to get off the train and say, yes, I wanna claim that for myself. But if we stay on the train and say, no, I can turn this train around, or we can argue with ourselves and say, no, I think this train is going in the right direction, then we're going to have to live with that decision. If we're not willing to look hard at ourselves in the mirror, and ask daily, like, Lord, am I following you well? Where in my life do I need to be better? Where in my life do I need to challenge myself more or make more time for you? Again, it won't just fall in our lap. But if we find ourselves constantly focusing on everything wrong around us and not focusing inward, we're just going to become gossips, bitter, resentful, negative people. And those are not people that are fun to be around. I have a few friends who... Um, or people that I know, acquaintances too, who um, they're constantly complaining about, um, you know, relationships not working out, jobs not working out, always, you know, there's always something wrong with this person or that church or that sermon or, you know, this way of life or that, whatever it is. And sometimes I just want to say like, do you recognize there's one common denominator in all of this? And it's you. That maybe we are the factor but if we don't come to terms with that, we're always going to find an excuse to find something negative somewhere else. I say this often. It's one of the greatest pieces of wisdom I've, I've ever been given. And it's that we often judge ourselves by our intentions and others by their actions. What we should do is judge others by their intentions and ourselves by our actions. So what that means is we tend, if we make a mistake, we tend to be more generous to ourselves and say, well, that wasn't my intention. But when other people make a mistake, we jump on the action and say, that was wrong, that was bad, you shouldn't have done that, I can't believe they did that. What we should do is the opposite. When we look at other people's actions to ask the question, well, why might they have done that? If I assume this person is good and has good intentions, how might I respond? How would I want someone to respond to me if I had made that mistake, but I had good intentions? And then we look at our own lives, we pay attention to our actions and say, okay, even though I had good intentions, could this have hurt someone? Was this maybe potentially interpreted the wrong way? Did I act in a way that wasn't, a, was there a better way for me to have acted 
upon those good intentions. That way we will be far less judgmental and condemning of others, we'll be very challenging ourselves to personal growth, and we'll be more accepting of the fact that everyone makes mistakes. No one wakes up in the morning and says, I can't wait to be evil today, you know, at least very few people. And I think those people who are inherently evil probably think somewhere in the back of their twisted mind that they're doing something good. But it's been corrupted, distorted, and twisted. And that's not something to glorify or not something to justify, but to recognize like nobody is really having that mindset, like seeking to do evil every single day, except for the devil and his demons. And if we start looking around and acting as though everyone is like that, we're doing a discredit to God's creation. We're basically telling God that he made evil. And he made people evil. Instead of recognizing everyone is made in the image and likeness of God, meaning everyone is inherently good and desires to do good. But sometimes it's complicated. All the time it's complicated because of sin, because of our own inabilities, our own uh, lack of perfection, the way that sin distorts and affects us, all of that. And so we need to be able to accept that in others because we very easily accept it in ourselves. How can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove that splinter in your eye? Uh, This also points back to something in uh, last week's gospel. Um, Stop judging and you will not be judged. Stop condemning and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. This is another kind of elaboration of that. I also like in this that they use the word brother. Now, the word brother here is adelphos, which means it can mean relative, can mean cousin, can mean, uh, you know, uncle. It's a kind of a, a general term to mean kin or relative. It also can be, mean brother. And it was also the word that was used in the early Christian community in the way that people talked about one another, even if they weren't kin, because we all became family in the body of Christ by virtue of our baptism. And so this can be people in your own family, uh, also people in your own church community or your own friend community. Um, And let me remove that splinter in your eye. Splinter sometimes is translated in other Bibles as a speck of chaff. Now, speck of chaff is the the small uh, husks or parts of grain that um, someone who had a threshing fork or a winnowing fan, when they were harvesting grain, would separate from the grain on a big threshing floor. And what that would do is it would cause all the grain to fall on the floor and then all of, they would open the doors of the barn or where the threshing floor was or it would be out in the field and the wind would come and blow away all the lightweight chaff. And so chaff was something that was like very, very lightweight, very inconsequential, not this big thing. And it's a speck, a speck of chaff or a splinter. Like think about how small a splinter is like, and then compare that to a wooden beam. So like obvious and Uh, obtrusive, you know, like it it would completely distort our ability to see clearly. So I just think that just speaks so true of the human experience that we tend to see these tiny things in other people and turn them into these wooden beams. And we see these wooden beams in our own life and we turn them into tiny specks and try to justify them or make them disappear because we think we're right. We don't want to deal with it. We're too insecure to admit that we need help or that we may be struggling. And so it's a challenge for us to really recognize how can I maybe confide in people who are trying to hold me accountable? How can I admit these are the areas I need growth or the things I don't know or the struggles I have in my relationship with God? I can do that with other people or I can just bring them honestly to God in prayer. But from what Jesus tells us all over the Gospels, it's so much more vibrantly lived out when we do it with other people. Our faith is so much more easy, so much more vibrant, so much more fulfilled and transformative when it's lived out in the way it was designed in the context of a church community. That's why it says where two or three are gathered in my name, I am with them. It doesn't mean that God is not with us when we're alone, but it's propelling the community to recognize there is a gift in being together and a way God is present when we are together, that he is not present when we are alone, even though he is still present in a different way. So how can we recognize our need for that in our own lives? You hypocrite, remove the wooden beam from your eye first, then you will see clearly and remove the splinter in your brother's eye. So, this does not say that we do not correct others, that we do not um, do what in the church is called fraternal correction. You can read about how to do that in Matthew chapter 18, verses I think 15 to 18, somewhere in there. uh, About how if a brother sins against you, go uh, by yourself in private and address that with him. And if he doesn't listen, take along two or three friends 
uh, to try and judge uh, and, and determine maybe you're off base, but also to encourage the other person if they have done something wrong to try and reconcile. And if that doesn't work, bring them to the church. And if the church doesn't convince them or help them, then you can kind of cut that person off or you can allow that person to remain um, in the wrong now. The, the forgiveness, um, what you have given or the correction that you were trying to give, your responsibility for that has been exhausted and now it's on the other person. They just refuse to budge. They're too proud, too stubborn, whatever it may be. So it, this is not saying that we don't do that, that we don't correct. However, we have to recognize that we have to correct ourselves first and only, only when we have really dealt with those wooden beams in our lives, our own pride, our own preconceived notions, our own judgments, our own lack of charity in whatever way that might be, only when we've reconciled that and really worked on that can we have the necessary compassion, gentleness, kindness, and mercy to deal with other people in those moments of correction because they're difficult. I think often of um, when I read this of like parents and children, as children are growing up, maybe falling out of faith or not wanting to go to church or exhibiting certain decisions, lifestyles or friendships or relationships that are the, the parents don't like. It's very easy to just get in and correct. You know, there's a wooden beam, there's a wooden beam, there's a wooden beam. Stop doing that. That's not how you were raised. Uh, you no, know, we have to go to church on Sunday. And those things just aren't effective. They drive children further and further away. Very rarely does that kind of authoritative judgment or condemnation of decisions really result in a favorable relationship or trusting relationship with the church. And so it involves a lot of patience. It involves unconditional love and being willing to go to that person, recognizing I'm a broken sinner and they're a broken sinner. So let me get to know them as a broken sinner and love them in that place, and then invite them to the place where I as a broken sinner have found healing. All of that reframes how we might have a lot of the different conversations about faith that we have in the context of our family, our friendships, community, when it comes to politics, all these different things. Helps us build a common ground and recognize we're not that different. We're not that different. Continuing now into the second section of this, a tree known by its fruit. A good tree does not bear rotten fruit, nor does a rotten tree bear good fruit. So the whole context of this is basically saying it is in something's nature, their natural outgrowth of their character will bear the fruit that they're going to bear. So if someone's character is good, it will be a natural outgrowth of that person's good character to bear good fruit. If someone's character is bad, if they're forming bad habits, um, falling into vice, then that is going to naturally manifest and have a bad outgrowth in the form of bad fruits. Things that are like selfishness and moral behavior, all these different things that are listed throughout the, the scriptures. Uh, this also, I think, speaks to a sense of doing versus being. You know, I think sometimes we can think like, oh yeah, I'm a good person. I'm a good person. I, I, I don't kill anybody. I don't hurt anyone. Um, I don't steal. I don't lie. Okay, well, that's just a lot of things that you don't do. But what do you do? What are the good fruits? And those are good things. Those are good things that we don't do, though, you know, that we should be celebratory of those. But are we holding ourselves to the bare minimum or are we calling ourselves to heavenly perfection and constantly trying to attain that, even though we'll never get there on this earth? You know, where do we set the bar so that we are constantly forming better character so that our natural outgrowth will always be good and will always produce good fruit? I heard it said, and I think I've shared before, um, that consistent prayer and consistent sin cannot coexist in the same place. I think it's serious. Serious prayer and serious sin cannot coexist in one place. One will destroy the other. So either serious prayer will begin to destroy serious sin in our life, or serious sin will begin to overcome and destroy serious prayer in our life. The two cannot coexist long term. Maybe momentarily, maybe for a very short season, but one will destroy the other. And eventually, we will know that by fruits. There'll be good things happening in our life, we'll affect people in a good and positive way, we'll have good and positive and joyful interactions, or everything around us will be worthy of criticism, we'll start to be one of those people who's constantly attacking others, or we'll rescind and turn away from all the good things in life and turn toward things that are harmful to us, things that do not honor our dignity, that do not help us remain healthy, mind, body, and soul. And so it's important for us to recognize what are the fruits in our life? Does anyone 
know the gospel who wouldn't have known it otherwise because of you? Does anyone have a better life who wouldn't have otherwise because of you? And yes, it's easy to say in our families, well, like my children and this and that, but you know, those are natural relationships that we were gifted by God. But what about going outside of those? You know, those are our most important relationships and they need a lot of time and investment. And so yes, we hopefully have instilled the gospel and love in those relationships. And that is where our primary call is, is to our family or to our, our immediate friendships, the people God has placed us most frequently in relationship with. However, it can be easy to just box in. You know, the church is not the four walls where you worship. The church is the body of Christ. The church has no walls, no geographical location, no boundary. But we worship in different parishes and different, you know, geographic churches. Not so that we can come together and say, look how great we are, look how holy we are, but so that we can get recharged, remember what Jesus did for us, and go out and share that with others out in the context of the mission field where the real church work happens. It says in one of the letters of Peter that we are the living stones of the church. It is us. That if every single church building disappeared or was demolished or destroyed tomorrow, the church would still exist because you and I as baptized believers are still alive and still seeking to share the kingdom, the good news of Jesus Christ with other people. Is that bearing good fruit in your life or not? When you look at your life, are you happy? Are you joyful? And I'm not saying, is your job perfect? Is your family perfect? Do you not have any suffering? Do you not have any problems? But what is your general disposition and outlook? Do you trust God? Do you believe that he's working for your greatest possible good? Do you pray? Is that bearing fruit in your life? Do people like being around you? Do you have good relationships? Are you investing your time in things that bring you joy? And that really bear good fruit in your life? Or are you wasting all your time on these things that you hate doing? Is there a way that you can rebalance that, refocus, reshape it, transform it? To where you're still meeting the needs of your responsibilities, but you're not putting so much emotional effort, time, or energy into these things. And you're investing them more in the things that give you life. Your relationship with God first and foremost, then your primary vocation. Whether that's to the religious life, the single life, you're married, whatever it might be and to your family and your friendships. Are those things rising to the surface in your life in a positive way, or are they getting buried by the weight and the badge of busyness simply because there's so much to do? There'll always be so much to do. It's up to us to prioritize it. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For people do not pick figs from thorn bushes, nor do they gather grapes from brambles. Basically saying we cannot expect all these good things to start happening if we don't make a change. If we're allowing a terrible, miserable environment to exist in our life, in our work life, in what we do for a living, and how we approach work, and how we approach family, whatever it may be, if we're not willing to make a change, then some, the good fruits aren't just going to fall out of nowhere. It's not just going to pass. That will continue to persist until we take it into um, our own control. A good person, out of the store of goodness in his heart, produces good. Now, Pay attention to phrasing there. A good person out of the store of goodness in his heart. That means this person has, has worked over time to store up goodness, just as someone would store up grain over an entire season, an entire harvest, in order to produce the good of having food for the community. So it's not going to happen immediately. It takes effort. It takes time. It takes consistency to be able to build up a storehouse in such a way that it overflows and is fruitful but that is done by a series of small decisions, a, a series of small crops. Okay, you don't just grow one big apple and then you survive on that forever. No, you have a bunch of different apple trees and then you pick those, you harvest them and you have a bunch of apples. The same thing is true with virtues and with vices. It, it's not like we have to go out and uh, become missionaries and work miracles every day, at least biblical type of miracles. I would argue that there are miracles happening all around us that we don't see every day. But nonetheless, if we go out and we sow good deeds in small things that we do, in being compassionate to our coworkers, smiling at strangers, holding the door open for others, um, casually starting up conversation or encouraging people we see that are sad, making new friends, whatever it is, you know, being kind to waiters and waitresses and our baristas and the people who serve us, not being snarky or proud or rude, all of those things, those small deeds that we do, as well as the most important, sharing the gospel with people. 
will eventually store up to produce good naturally. It will be a natural outgrowth of who we are. We won't even realize like that we're like incapable of doing anything but good, incapable of doing anything but sharing the gospel by the way we live or the way we speak it. It will just become so second nature. But the challenge is the same thing is true of the bad things. That if we make small decisions, slowly, repeatedly, in the wrong direction, then suddenly we have this massive storehouse of sin to deal with, of bad habits, of addictions, of vices, of immoral behavior with all these other ripple effects and consequences that don't only affect us, but our families, our relationships, all of that. <clears throat> it's like the analogy of a frog in boiling water. If you put a frog in boiling water, the frog will jump out. But if you put a frog in cold water and you slowly turn the water up to a boil, the frog will die. It will not jump out of the water because the frog doesn't recognize that the environment is slowly changing. Same is true for us. If you throw us into a very evil, sinful situation or lifestyle, all of a sudden we will be repulsed by it. We'll say, no, I don't want to do that. That's radically different from my experience. But if we slowly start paving the road there with bad decisions, little ones, being short with our family, um, telling a lie, not holding to our word, lashing out in anger, slowly, slowly, we will suddenly be formed into this person that is surrounded by this deadly environment that just only causes more negativity to erupt around us. It's a gut check for you and I to really maybe do an examine or really ask like, how am I living my life? Are people encouraged by me? Are people given life when they're around me? Or do they feel drained? Am I one who is common to be angry, to yell, to complain, to be negative? Or am I one who gives life to other people in the words that I say and the things that I do? But an evil person, out of sore of evil, produces evil. Far, for from the fullness of the heart, the mouth speaks. This comes from the Jewish conception of the fact that the heart and the mouth are linked, kind of like the eyes and the soul. And the heart was the seat of emotion. It was where our emotions were kept, kind of our sense of rationality. And so if we are not able to have a healthy sense of our emotional state and our rational mind, if we start to make irrational decisions, that will come out in what we say. And there is a lot in scripture about hypocrisy and evil of the tongue. But we have to be very conscious of what we say because you cannot take words back. Words can often hurt far longer than a physical injury. And so maybe this is a time also for you and I to be conscious of the things that we've said to others that we need to ask forgiveness of. The things that have been left unsaid that really need to be said in order to help others know that we love them or to bring about reconciliation in our relationships. To not sit by in pride and say, no, that person did it. I mean, people who have family feuds that have lasted for years and nobody can remember how they even started. Lay down your pride. Be the person to reach out. Be the person to say, you know, honestly, I can't even remember why we had this fight. I just miss you. And I'm sorry for my part in it. I'm sorry for everything I did that hurt you. And I just want you to know that I love you. It doesn't mean that we accept everything that the other person did as okay. But expressing that unconditional love. That estranged child, inviting them back home and saying, look, we may not agree on faith, we may not agree on your lifestyle, but I want you to know that I love you. And this thing is hurting you, and I really wish you would turn away from that, but come home, because I love you, and I, I want to be part of your life, and I'm sorry for the ways that I hurt you, the things that I said, the ways that was judgmental or pressured you. I miss you. Maybe we just need to have some of those conversations in the relationships that have gone astray, or the ways that uh, unforgiveness is persisting in our lives. So whether that's true for you or not, I think we can all be challenged in a good way by these uh, verses this week in Luke's Sermon on the Plain, the words of Jesus encouraging us to really look inward and ask, am I following Jesus? Am I following blind guides out there in the world? Celebrities, life gurus, ways of life that I think are going to make me happy. Other people, other relationships that I think are going to fulfill me when only Jesus truly can. And am I willing to put in the consistent time and effort to get there so that by sowing consistent small good deeds each day, making an effort, prioritizing them, I will store up good within me and it will be a natural outpouring of that character by virtue of God's grace 
and God's grace alone through the sacraments, through a life of prayer that will be working in my own life for the good of others and the good of those around me. I pray that is true for you and I, and I pray that that is what convicts and challenges us to make some changes in our life this week, to be more conformed to the disciples that Jesus is calling us to be, and to be more conformed to the good in all areas of our life. But it will take reprioritizing and really asking, where do I spend my time, Lord? And where are you calling me to spend more? Where are you calling me to spend less? In fact, my word of 2022, because I choose a word each year, my word is less. And it's been a difficult thing for me, someone who is very much a doer, very efficiency and productivity minded, to really be able to take a step back from certain things and say, you know what, I don't need to worry about that anymore. Maybe I don't need to do that, or I don't need to invest as much time and energy into this or that. But really focus on the core things that I see bearing fruit, that I see exploding and expanding. This may not be that big in terms of YouTube, but you know, this Bible study, we have a lot of people participating, usually about you know, 40 to 50 a week, both in person and online live. And then later on YouTube, we usually get maybe 150 views. And the past few weeks, that has jumped to 900, almost 1,000 per video. And I don't know why, but I can see that the Lord is bearing fruit. The Lord is allowing good things and graces to come from this. And so I pray for you. I hope you pray for me. And I pray that you will invite other people to know the treasure of sacred scripture and this community by inviting them into this experience of diving into the word, being challenged by it, and really seeking to grow as disciples of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the gift of all that you've given us. Thank you for these words to challenge and convict us to follow you more faithfully. We pray, God, that we would look primarily at our calendars this week and ask ourselves, does this indicate where my priorities are, or where I would like them to be. And make all necessary adjustments, cancellations, appointments, coffee dates, father-daughter, father-son, mother-daughter, mother-son dates, family outings, uh, parents' night out, date night, whatever it needs to be. And especially prioritizing that time with you in prayer. Holy hours, times in mass, times to get back to confession, whatever it means to really do those small deeds to work toward that storehouse of good that you were calling us to have so that we can experience the good life, the life of freedom that you were calling us to. Thank you, Jesus. We pray all of this in your most precious name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.